Thank you, Linda. That was great. Hi. Two other uh, things I got to share with. One is that uh, we had a better report on Miss Sydney, and uh, pray that she need to do well. And uh, then the other, remember uh, the Scott Stevenson. He was uh, having a little trouble, some health problems, so keep him in your prayers. And, uh, but hopefully he'll be bouncing back, uh, bouncing back pretty quickly. Uh, all right, I sent you a head up, heads up. We'll see how you do with the riddles. And uh, gave you a heads up, a little text I sent you today. We're going to be uh, hearing a story about dogs in a minute, so I got a couple of dog riddles. First of all, what is a market that dogs don't like to go? They avoid at all cost. That's right, the market. There you go. Y'all are geniuses. All right. One cat story. Uh, do you know that uh, uh, when a cat meows, who they're talking to? Anybody have an idea? Just a random fact. It's not a riddle. It's actually a true thing. Those riddles are nonsense. But uh, anyway, you know, a cat, when a cat meows, it's talking to a human. Cats don't meow any other time. Do you know that? So they're just talking to humans. So and they're saying, where's the food? I think that's what they're saying. All right, the last dog riddle. What is the name of the most famous dog detective? Nobody knows? He's famous. There are movies about him. What? Oh, it's, it's Sherlock Bones. You know. All right. Well, that's the best I can come up with. Uh, later on, we'll get to a dog story. The title of this morning's message is Who is boss. We're going to look at several places, a number of places in God's Word, but one of the great places to start is uh, the sermon that Peter gave at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, and uh, we're going to look at all through God's Word, but if you look in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, we see the sermon at Pentecost, and what does uh, Peter have to say? He says in Acts 2, 36, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, who? Both Lord and Christ. He has made him both Lord and Christ. What we're going to look at today is the fact that Jesus is Lord. That's just a fact. And the question you have is whether you will acknowledge him as Lord of your life and whether you will receive him as a Savior in your life. Now, if you ask the question of people, who is the boss? It's an easy answer most people give you, and that is what? I'm the boss. That's what people will often say. In my life, I have visited countless homes and all different kinds of environments. And in several of those environments, I've come across five-year-old little boys, and you know what they've said? I'm the boss. And they were right, and their homes were terrorizing. It was a tough thing. But uh, it's a question we all ask in our life. Who is the boss of our life? And as we look into that passage, as, uh, as Peter is preaching at Pentecost, it says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, what? Both Lord and Christ. Jesus is Lord, and he needs to be the Lord and boss of your life. Now, this morning I like to tell you a dog story. I like dog stories, and uh, and I want and uh, and also tell you what the Bible has to say about Jesus' lordship over your life, and then give you the opportunity to declare Him as Lord of your life. Now, the story about a dog is about the dog Petros, and it's a story told uh, by a guy named Patrick Morley in his little book. And uh, Petros in Greek, of course, means Peter, like Peter, uh, the disciple of Jesus. He begins the story by telling about Petros, and he says, Petros was a scuffer, scruffy, mongrel dog at the local animal shelter, and he was in a bad spot. He was uh, on course to be destroyed. And so the master of a uh, plantation or area 
uh, or a uh, estate heard about uh, this dog, and he was gripped with compassion. And so the master had his, one of his servants go down and get the uh, mangy animal and bring them into his home and clean him up. The very first words that Petros heard were this, I love you very much. And he said, everything I have is for your enjoyment. And he made several promises to Petros. First he said, you'll have a large yard to roam. You'll be well fed. And you can come and sit by my side anytime and I promise to protect you and to watch over you. But he said, I've got several rules that you need to abide by. One, I have other dogs that I brought into my estate. And I brought them home with me. And I ask that you love them as I love you. He said, there's plenty of food. There's plenty for everyone to share. And he said, also, from time to time, I'm going to welcome new dogs and when they come in, I expect you to teach them about me and how to live as one uh, of the man. Help them to learn what it means to belong to me. And he says, now everybody has work to do, and you will need to do your fair share. And he also said, you need to stay inside the fence that I've erected. The fence is there for your protection, because there are many dangers to a dog outside of that fence, and I want to spare you because you've already been through so much in your life, experienced so many hardships. When Petros heard this, he was filled with joy. He had heard about a place like this, but he really couldn't believe that it actually existed. Now, the other dogs the master had were varied, all different shapes and sizes and different kinds of breeds. The only common denominator that he could find was that the master had taken them in and he loved them. The older taught him about the master. But to his amazement, a few of the dogs did not appreciate being in the master's home and didn't appreciate what the master had done for them. Some said the yard is too small and we get the same food every single day. And they believed that life outside of the fence in the forest would be much more exciting. Each year, in fact, a number of the dogs would actually dig under the fence and would escape never to be seen from again. And everyone is that talked this disgruntlement said they're better off. Well, the truth is that was a lie. Life outside the fence was cruel, and most of the dogs ran in packs, and that was dangerous. And in fact, there were limited resources outside of the fence, and the only way they actually survived is that each night the master would take, have his servants take leftover food and deposit it outside of the fence so that those animals that had run away could have some food to survive on. Sadly, one night, Petros decided to join those who were running away. He followed them under the fence. When this rebellious group got to the other side, they quickly disbanded and went their separate ways because they could never agree on who was going to be the leader of their new pack. Petro was excited about his newfound freedom and the fact that he was now his own master. But as he lay down that night on the hard earth in the cold, he sure did miss his blanket that rested every night by the master's fireplace. The next day he decided if he was going to survive, he better find a pack. And he began to go meet these packs. Some of them were evil. They were bent on taking advantage of others. Others were industrious and they were trying to get their area of their pack to look just like the master's Others, in fact, had picked a leader and decided that was their new master, and everyone was required to lick the feet of the master, of that so-called master, just like Petros had licked the hand of his master. He was excited for his, free, his freedom, but he knew something was missing. And he noticed that the longer the dogs were away from the master, the more skinnier they became and the sicker they became. One night, uh, Petros had been gone for three days, and the master's heart was broken. And so the master sent out a search party looking for him, and they finally found him. And they pleaded with him to return home. And though he was lonely and hungry, 
He could not admit to himself that he made a mistake, and so he said no. The search party told him that he was always welcome to return home and then sadly return back to the master. As the days passed, Petros learned one simple truth. He began to see that in order for a dog to be happy, he needed more than mercy and allowing a master to save him. He needed to come under the long-term care and protection of the master. The forest was mean and a hard place because it deceived a dog into thinking he needed to get his own way to be happy. There was one truth that Petros didn't understand and did not know, and that was all dogs didn't know, and that was the fact that the master's estate included not only the proper the inside the fence, but he owned the forest as well. Ironically, all the runaway dogs were nothing more than squatters on the master's land. Yet the master was gracious, and even though he they had rejected him, he continued to prove to provide for them and for their care. I'll bet it was uh, limited by letting them use the forest and though, and as it was theirs. They simply did not understand that he owned everything as far as the eye could see, and he was actually Lord of all. And you know, in that story, though it's made up story, is a story that's true for all of us in our relationship to God. Just like Petrus, many of us try to be our own master. And we need to know a couple simple truths. One, we need to understand the truth that Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. We cannot escape that effect that He is Lord of our life and we must seek to, to, to belong to Him. There's a great passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul talks about our relationship to God. And in this passage, he shares something that is true in our reality today and something that is true in what is to come in the future. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he says this. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. He says that at the name of Jesus, every Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I remember one year uh, we did an Easter musical and I sang in the choir that time. And there was a song that we sang and it had that line, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And Sundays are kind of crazy for me. A lot of things going on and preparing, and I think on that day my brain was a little scrambled, and so when it came time to sing that song, what came out of my mouth was, every, every tongue shall bow and every knee confess. And uh, I got some weird looks from the rest of the choir. But what we find here is a present reality, a present reality, uh, a pr and a proclamation of the future present reality is that Christ is Lord right here and right now. And He's the Lord of who? He's the Lord of everyone. Now, does everyone acknowledge Him? The answer is no. Everyone does not acknowledge Him. But what? He is still Lord nonetheless. And in the future, everyone, and I mean everyone, will proclaim Him Lord. They will have no choice. He is simply Lord. In fact, there's coming a time when Jesus returns, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to him because he's Lord. It's a fact. I was looking over in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and it says this, And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Jesus created everything. It exists because of him. He is Lord. And if you look in Romans Chapter 14, verses 8 through 9. Romans chapter 14. I can get over there. Verses 8 through 9. It says this. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. He's Lord because He's God's Son. He's Lord because He died on the cross for our sins. He's Lord because He rose from the grave. 
And whether you're living here today or you're in heaven, who is Jesus? He is your Lord. Now, you know what the Bible says the good news is in Acts 10, 36? The good news is this. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And that's good news. Why? Because who else would you want to be Lord in this political season? Look around. Any of these politicians, you want to be the Lord of your life and the Lord of eternity? I don't think so. Even the ones I may vote for, I don't want them to be that. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and that is the good news. That is the good news. Now, there are a lot of people that want to be Lord, aren't there? In fact, back in Paul's day and in, in the times, the emperors wanted to be Lord. And in fact, some of them demanded to be called Lord. And one emperor petition, particular, uh, Domitian, issued a decree that began this way, Our Lord and God commands. In other words, he said, I'm your Lord and I'm your God. That's how you're going to address me. And John declared that such titles are blasphemous and that Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is the only one that needs to be the emperor of your life and the only one that Christians could recognize. And in fact, when Paul was writing Revelation, he recorded this. He said, on his robe and the his is Jesus. On his robe and on his thigh he has written this, King of kings and Lord of of lords. And that's who Jesus is. He is Lord. Now, a lot of people want to be Lord, but He is Lord. He is Lord because He is God. He is Lord because He died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead for our eternal life. And we are not Lord either. I was reading the other day, and someone said simply this listen. He said, The question isn't whether or not Jesus is Lord, He is. The question is whether or not you will acknowledge him, will acknowledge the fact that he is Lord. You know, we are not our own. We like to be proud and, and strong. And uh, my dad loved John Wayne. I like his movies too. But John Wayne, you always strap up your own boots and go on your way. You don't need anybody. That's kind of what a lot of those movies were. But you know what? We need somebody. We need a Lord. And not only that, we belong to Him. We are not free to make our own decisions. He is Lord. Over in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, it says, You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You've been bought at a price. God created you. He redeemed you. Without that, you are in slavery. You have no hope. You're only free to make choices because you belong to him. And over in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it says this, There is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. We wouldn't have anything without Jesus. We wouldn't be able to exist without him. So Jesus is Lord. And the second simple thing is, since Jesus is Lord, you need to choose to acknowledge him as the Lord of your life. I was reading the other day, and, and someone summarized what it means to have Jesus as the Lord of your life. He said, you've probably heard someone say, or maybe you've said it yourself, Jesus was my Savior, but not my Lord. And he said, nothing could be more wrong. He is always the Lord and always has been. He is the Lord of all men at all times, in all places. And whether they acknowledge it or not, as Lord Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all men, even those who spurn his name, and as Savior, the redeemer of those who believe, we belong to Jesus. He is our owner. He is our benefactor. In fact, he is our Lord, whether he is our Savior or not. In other words... How does he become your Savior? When you believe in him. You believe in him and he becomes your Savior. How does he become your Lord? He already is. You look around today and people live in mock and rebellion against God. He is still their Lord. They are still responsible to him. They will be accountable to him someday. He is still their Lord, not necessarily their Savior. He wants to be their Savior. He loves them. He died for them. He has given all for him, them. But, uh, but you have to choose to receive him as your Savior. Now, how do you make Christ 
Lord of your life. I found an example of somebody the other day named F.B. Meyer. And who was that? Well, he was a Baptist preacher, not in Elmore County, uh, but in London back at the turn of the century, not the 2000th century, but the 19th century. And he was in the midst of a very successful ministry. And he confessed as time went on that he felt something was deeply lacking in his life and ministry. Dr. Mayer related that his life and ministry was marred because why? He kept something back from the Lord. In fact, he described it this way. He says, in my life is like my house, a bunch of keys. All the different keys open the rooms of my life. And he says, I had given the Lord a bunch of keys and thought that was enough. But I realized I always held one key back, one place that the Lord was not allowed to go that I kept just for me. That key that, one, that opened the one door was sh shut the Lord out which meant that I had incomplete consecration. And because of that, he said, I lacked power, I lacked assurance, I lacked joy, and I lacked peace. And you know, the joy of the Lord begins when we hand all the keys over to him. The question is, does he have the key to every room in your life? Ever heard of a guy named Regis Philbin? Anybody hear of him? Now, if you don't know Regis, you've seen him. Why? Because uh, Regis had a show forever. And also because Regis um, was on TV more than any human person alive. In fact, that was his great record and claim to fame. He'd been on TV more than anybody. And on the day that he retired on his last show, TV show, uh, the mayor of New York at that time, a guy named Bloomberg, gave him what? What they always give out, a key to the city. Now, will that key open any door in New York City? Not a one. But what does it symbolically mean? It symbolically means that he's welcome anywhere in New York. Symbolically meant you're invited to come in anywhere because you're a special, have a special relationship to us here in the city. The question is, is Christ welcome in every aspect of your life? You know, he has a right to every aspect. As I read in 1 Corinthians, in 6, 19 and 20, he has a right to. He's bought you at a price. He sacrificed his son. He's given everything paid for you. He has a right to be there. And you will never find power or happiness until he is there. For him to be Lord means you give the keys to your life and the throne to your heart. Now, why do you acknowledge him as Lord? Well, you acknowledge him as Lord because of several reasons. One, because you'll never be fully happy unless he is Lord. Look at a couple of passages. We're going to look in John and Luke and look at four rule of passages real quick. In John chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. In John 15, verses 10 and 11, listen to what Jesus says about happiness and about joy. In John 15, verses 10 and 11, listen to what he says. If you obey my commands... You will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told this so that your joy, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be what? Complete. Want to be joyful? Want to have joy complete your life? Then live in obedience to him. Open up your life to him, every aspect of your life to him. And then John chapter 12 Verse 24, John chapter 12, verse 24. Verse 26, I'm sorry. It says, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. A lot of times when all is said and done, we want to have a life that's what? Honorable. A life of honor. Do you want to have joy? You want to have honor? Then open your life to God. Serve Him. Surrender your life to Him. And in Luke, a couple of quick passages. One in Luke 11, 27 and following. Luke 11, chapter 27 and 28. He says, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out and says, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. 
Jesus said, well, that's great. Everybody loves their mother. But he goes on in verse 28, and he says, he replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. You want a blessed life? Obey God. And the first thing God says is surrender your whole life to me. And then finally, John chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. He says, then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For if whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his very self? To know true life, you must surrender your life to God. And then you can know true life. Now, you may Christ Lord by surrendering yourself to him. Now, you know, the truth is that all people, men and women, everybody wants to be what? It doesn't sound deep theologically, but you talk to anybody, what does everybody want in life? They want to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. But as you look around, so many people fail to be happy. They're miserable. No matter what they've got or, or who they are, they fail. They're not happy. And why? Because they dis fail to discover the one sure path to happiness. Happiness does not consist in getting what we want. But that's always what we think, isn't it? If I just get what I want, if I just get my way, if I get my car, if I get the money, the promotion, the job, the house, if I just get this, if everything just goes my way, I'll be happy. You look at a lot of folks like that, they got everything, and they're what? They got misery. In fact, you say, well, that's not true. Well, look at the most famous, wise person of all time and rich person of all time. Who was that? He was a guy named what? Solomon. And he had everything. He proved that happiness does not come merely from getting what you want. He wanted to have a bunch of wives. And that about destroyed him. He got more wives you can shake a stick at, more riches, more wealth. And it was all vanity, vanity. Rather, happiness is built on what? It's built on a foundation that Jesus Christ is what? He's Lord of all, but he's Lord of my life. The path to happiness is one that leads back to where? The master's estate. Where he is standing at the gate and to say one word, I've missed you and welcome home. Unless you're living on the master's estate, willing to yield to the master, you will never know happiness. James 4.8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Reach out to God whether for the first time or the 50th time in prayer. And if you will, no matter who you are, what you've done, where you be, you will experience his presence and maybe for the first time in life, the happiness you long for. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise you that you came to be our Savior to redeem us from our sins. And today, Lord, we acknowledge that you are our Lord and you know what is best and you hold the keys to our happiness, our hope, and our future. And Lord, for all of us here, let us have the courage to look around and realize that we're miserable without you. And the only way for you to rule in our life and to have your blessing in our life is for us to totally open up and give you the keys to our lives. And if there's anyone here today that's not done that, that's holding something back, Lord, please let them, let their clenched fist open. Let them turn to you, Lord, and call out and ask for your grace and mercy. Let us know your joy and let us know your peace. Let us know your abundance. We love you, Lord. We need you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation, a time to respond to the fact that uh, we need Christ to be Lord. And you know, um, when you're young, you make decisions for the Lord all the time. In fact, sometimes uh, I've seen kids just go to the altar, go to the altar, go to the altar, and you just think, when are they going to get over this? The trouble is they do. Because... That'll never stop. All our life, we need to come back to God because so many times we begin to think, I got this. And the moment we do this, we are sunk, sunk, sunk. And I remember uh, thinking about a lady that attended a church. 
years ago. Her name was Lavert Caldwell. She was a sweet lady. And um, she would come down. Two weeks didn't pass. She didn't make some decision for the Lord. She was some lady late in her 80s, taught Sunday school. And every time she would come and tell me she's rededicating her life to the Lord, I begin to think, just how wild of a life is she doing that she's running wild, you know, at, at this age. But you know what? Somewhere in her life, she knew that she didn't have all of God because God didn't have all of her. And she wanted to know the joy of God. And for her, it took like every other week. And, you know, probably that's true for every one of us. You know, we need to pause we get so busy in life and let God have our lives. Otherwise, we live in our own control. The worst person to run your life is you because you're going to mess it up. God loves you, and he wants your life to be a blessing. We're going to have time of invitation. Sing to God, and if you need to, someone to pray for you or you need to take a step of faith, today is a day for you. Let us stand. Our hymn of invitation is 300 without him, and without him we could do nothing. 300. And uh, we pray that you'll have a great week and that God will bless you and give you encouragement this week. Uh, our closing uh, chorus is we're going to sing the chorus to Sweet, Sweet Spirit. That's found on 243. So sing the chorus with us. Sweet, Holy Spirit.